Thanks, David, and thanks for getting the PowerPoint up and running. Yes, so as David mentioned, my involvement in Copenhagen was to go and present the, the Copenhagen diagnosis, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this report, and there's a website there, you can go and download this report uh, from the website, free of charge. We have hard copies available as well to the enthusiasts in the room. But the report was compiled by 26 climate scientists uh, from around the planet. We, uh, and there's a list of names there of the authorship in alphabetical order. We chose uh, an author group that could cover all of the science in the so-called Working Group 1 reports of the IPCC. And the reason we chose this group to span that area was that there was a sense among the authorship group that since the IPCC assessment report of 2007, that plenty of science had come along in the interim, and in particular, more observations had been made since the close-off of the material for the IPCC report that justified a scientific update uh, in time for the Copenhagen meeting. The 2007 IPCC report was a major undertaking by many, many authors. Uh, it took five or six years to put together, and there's no way we could match the scale of that report. It was 1,000 pages. Working Group 1 was about 1,000 pages long. Our document is about 65 pages long. It's written to be accessible to policymakers, the media, the general public. And the idea, as I said, was to update all of the science and observations that came about since the IPCC 2007 report. Uh, and I want to just spend the remaining seven or eight minutes that I have up here just to go through some of the messages that we found when reviewing all of the peer-reviewed science that was available to us over the last three or four years since the IPCC close-off. Now, the three major, I'll break down the, the, the diagnosis uh, findings into three major areas. And the first major area is that our fossil fuel emissions are on the rise. In fact, the lead author of this chapter, Corinne Le Curé, who's the co-chair of the Global Carbon Project, her words at Copenhagen were, our carbon emissions are out of control. And this diagram here shows you uh, what she means by that statement. It's billions of tonnes of carbon dioxide per annum emitted since 1990. And when you think about the fact that the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed off in 1992 that agreed that we shouldn't interfere with the planet's climate system at a dangerous level, then since this was ratified by virtually every nation on the planet, including the US and Australia and so on, we've actually done nothing but emitted uh, more and more each year. 41% rise since 1990 is a staggering level to me when you think that there was an international agreement to not interfere with the planet's climate system at dangerous levels. The growth rate in the 1990s was about 1% per year. You can see up to about 2000, and then from 2000 on it shoots up. Now this is partly because of the development of nations like China that were previously low per capita emitters. Uh, they've got very low per capita emissions compared to the US and Australia, yet their population is vast. So uh, their emissions are on the rise. This is one of the great political challenges of this issue is that we've got a lack of equity across the nations of of the planet. We've got some low emitters that are on developing trajectories. We've got high emitters that are stagnating with their emissions but not embracing low emitting technologies. The second major message from the report is that many of the climate indicators that scientists look at are changing at or above the levels that the IPCC projected in 2007. Uh, this first diagram is very important to go through. It shows global temperature changed since 1980, uh, graphed there in red from year to year. You can see very clearly natural year to year variability. This is part of the system. It's exactly what we expect from the climate. When you have an El Nino year, for example, in 1998, there's a very warm year because it's an El Nino year. It would be very foolish to say in the following year that global warming is over because it's just an El Nino uh, kink in the system. It's like saying that summer is over when a cool change comes through in January. It's just not the case. You can see there that blue envelope shows you the natural range of variability and that linear trend there is exactly what climate scientists would track. We don't track the year-to-year -year variations. We don't expect the year-to-year -year variations to match the carbon dioxide levels. We're looking at the decade-by-decade -decade trend and that is one of warming. I actually ran into Stephen Fielding immediately after our press conference and said to him in a very collegiate manner, Stephen, this is what we call the Stephen Fielding diagram amongst ourselves. And he took it in good humour and we had a nice chat 
And I showed him this diagram and I said, please go away and look at the text and, and try to understand what is the difference between intraannual variability and long-term change. The planet is warming and it is warming at the rate the IPCC projected. In contrast, there are other indicators of the climate system that are changing more rapidly than the IPCC projected. So air temperature is on track. It is warming. The last 10 years haven't been one of cooling. They have been warming. But sea ice in the Arctic, for example, this diagram shows you from the year 1900 forward to 2100, the range of IPCC projections for the sea ice coverage over the Arctic Ocean. And you can see the IPCC is projecting a decline in sea ice. Uh, worst case scenarios there is that the Arctic would be ice free in summer in 2100. The red curve shows the observations. And clearly, the observations are tracking below the IPCC projection. So Arctic sea ice is melting way faster than the very worst case of the IPCC models. So that tells us that nonlinear feedbacks there are kicking in faster than we projected several years ago. The system is changing more rapidly than we expected only just three years ago from the IPCC reports. Sea level is another indicator. Global sea level is another major indicator of the planet's climate. In glacial times, the glaciers build up, the sea level drops down up to 100 metres. During interglacials, the ice melts over the ice caps and the sea level rises. The IPCC projections of only a few years ago are shown in that grey envelope. And you can see from the satellite observations up to 2009 that we're tracking the very high end of the IPCC projections. So that was the, the second message. The first message, CO2 emissions are on the rise much more rapidly than they should be if we're concerned about our planet's climate system. The second message is that many indicators are changing more rapidly than we expected they would. So climate is changing more rapidly on the whole. The very last message that I'll spend a couple of minutes on is that our window of opportunity for addressing this problem in a meaningful way is rapidly closing. This diagram shows you in blue the reconstructed temperatures over the last few thousand, uh, last few hundred years back to the year 1600. And then the green, yellow, and red curves show scenarios of warming straight from the IPCC uh, fourth assessment reports from 2007. The B1 scenario is a scenario of very rapid emissions reductions, uh, decarbonizing at a rate that is not really on the table right now. And, uh, and the range there, though, indicates the climate sensitivity of the system. We can have carbon feedbacks that um, are good and kind to us and limit the change to just two degrees Celsius. We can have carbon feedbacks in this B1 scenario that push it up over three degrees uh, Celsius. The higher range, the A1F1 range, is the business as usual. A colleague of mine uh, affectionately termed this the George Bush scenario, and, and the green curve is the European Union scenario. But the George Bush scenario, if I can use that term just to rouse you from your slumber, is, is one where we have uh, no significant action on, on re, uh, reducing our emissions over the next few decades, ongoing population growth, ongoing use of the uh, fossil fuel technologies that we've had operating for several centuries. Uh, there's a very different climate in those two uh, curves, the green curve where we uh, attack the emissions and reduce them, and the red curve where we let things go on as business as usual. Uh, seven degrees Celsius global average warming locks in with certainty, for example, the melting of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. That raises sea level by tens of metres. It, it takes a long time to melt those glaciers. Uh, to melt the Antarctic, West Antarctic ice sheet that will raise sea level by about three or four metres uh, will, will take a century or two, at least. The glaciologists are concerned that a big slab of that ice sits over the ocean and nonlinear processes could speed that up. But by and large, we're looking at scenarios at that red end where many of the world's uh, cities that we've established at the coast would need to be re relocated and a scale of, of adaptation, uh, the cost of which would, would far outweigh mitigation today. I think this is my last scientific graph and sorry for so many view graphs in such a short time. I am the last person to have a PowerPoint slide, I believe bar one. Uh, but th these, these red and blue curves here emphasize this point again. The top one is carbon dioxide emissions. The red business as usual. The blue is the kind of trajectory that many nations are advocating to give us some decent chance of staying below two degrees Celsius global average warming. To achieve that, we need to peak in emissions sooner rather than later. Uh, peaking in emissions 
anything after than about 2020 locks in with, with uh, very high probability exceeding that two degree C threshold, which many nations, and in fact in Copenhagen, was adopted as something we should avoid doing. So just to reiterate, my background is a, is a climate scientist. I've shown you a very quick snapshot of the Copenhagen diagnosis, all in under 10 minutes. If you wish to read further, it is available online. And obviously during the Q&A, I'm happy to take questions, but that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.